So uh, today we're going to begin a new teaching series, um, a conversation that I'm really excited about. Um, it'll carry us from now until uh, the holidays. Um, it's a series that we're calling The Non-Essential Way, an invitation into the possibility of the moment. The Non-Essential Way, an invitation into the possibility of the moment. So uh, maybe you're like me, and over the past several months, you've grown sort of increasingly fatigued by all of the new buzzwords um, that have been floating around and that even just a few months ago um, were really new to all of us. So there's like the health related ones, right? COVID, pandemic, social distancing, flattening the curve, isolation, incubation, self-quarantine, community spread, herd immunity, epidemic, pandemic, lockdown, airborne, asymptomatic, contact tracing, and novel. People keep saying, well, this is a novel coronavirus. I don't know what that means really when people say that, but, but we say it a lot, it's everywhere. So there's all of those ones. Um, and then there's like the uh, churchy, businessy, cultural ones that are sort of like in the air now as well, right? Um, in the air probably isn't the best um, choice of words, but um, so there's amid, there's amidst, which isn't even a word, even though technically, even though we, we keep using it, unprecedented, work from home, in these challenging times, new normal, pivot, triggered, more disconnected than ever, deliverable, welcome, 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 church isn't a building, but we need to get back to the building, opportunity, essential, and non-essential. So um, maybe as I was um, blasting some of those words in us, um, you rolled your eyes. Uh, maybe uh, you felt a little bit nauseous um, or maybe you're thinking, Matt, it's quite unprecedented of you to trigger us by pivoting and delivering this more disconnected than ever list of new normals to us amid these challenging times. I'm sorry, it's just been so long and I miss you all so much. And maybe up until about 90 seconds ago, uh, you missed me too. <laughs> So uh, the name of this teaching series, The Non-Essential Way, um, is a bit of a lighthearted play on all of this, um, but hopefully uh, beyond the lightheartedness of essential and non-essential, um, there's a way that this conversation will offer um, a bit of a deeper meaning for each of us as well. So um, we're going to unpack essential and non-essential and what that all might mean in the coming weeks. Um, but even the way we're presenting those words um, with non in the brackets, the non-essential way, um, it's meant to sort of collapse and confuse these two categories into one another. Um, because as we all know, in the spiritual life and in real life, um, binary concrete categories um, don't actually work when the rubber hits the road. Um, so for all of the type A personalities, some of which I've already received a text message from, say, from saying, so is it the essential way or is it the non-essential way? Like, how do I say it? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, that's the point, um, that the differentiation between the two is understandable, um, but maybe not all that helpful. It's both and it's and. Uh, so how do we say, how do we say it? Like, how do we say the name of this teaching series? Because a few of you have already asked. Um, I would say, just say it fast, like when you're not sure how to pronounce someone's last name correctly. So it's an essential way. That's the name of this teaching series. And we're going to talk more about that in the coming weeks. So if all of that was like, what are you even talking about, Matt? Um, we'll get there. Um, but this morning, I actually want to unpack um, the tagline. So the non-essential way, an invitation into the possibility of the moment. Um, and I want to begin uh, with the words of Jesus as, as we unpack those words, an invitation into the possibility of the moment. Um, these words of Jesus are likely familiar to many of us, um, and they're words that we've even looked at briefly before at Open Circle. Um, so we're going to look at uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 15. So if you want to follow along, you can grab your Bible. Otherwise, um, I will read the text uh, deliberately and slowly and several times um, so that we can all keep up. 
So uh, the first words out of Jesus's mouth in the Gospel of Mark are found in this passage, um, and I think intentionally. Um, it's meant to be a framing for how the reader is meant to understand everything else Jesus says and does in Mark's telling of the Jesus story. Um, and it's also important to note here that Mark and the other gospel writers um, very intentionally paint a picture of a world um, that Jesus lives in, um, a world where um, the religious elite and the politically powerful have formed an unlikely alliance, um, where militarism and military occupation and imperial power um, provide the stability and the law and order of the society. Um, and it's a world where there's a very clear distinction between the wealthy and the poor, and there's very few people in between. Um, in short, this is not a kind world uh, for the average person to inhabit. Um, it's, it's a dark existence uh, for a lot of people. And uh, Jesus speaks these first words uh, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 15. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, uh, if you're familiar with Christianity and the Bible in any way, it's likely that the words in this passage um, may be loaded with some meaning for us. Um, and I suspect that the meaning that those words are loaded with could be both, help, both helpful and unhelpful. <laughs> um, so I want to spend a little bit of time on two phrases from this passage uh, to lay the foundation for this series. Um, we'll unpack uh, one phrase this morning um, and another phrase next week. Um, the phrase for this morning uh, is the phrase, the kingdom of God, um, in this passage. Jesus says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. I think for many of us, we often consider the kingdom of God as some sort of like future destination or location. Um, like when I die, I'll go to heaven, um, which I understand uh, why this provides comfort to us when we're facing our own mortality or the loss of those we love, that there's something else sometime and someplace beyond this time and place. Uh, but this isn't what Jesus is talking about uh, when he talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And this isn't what any first century uh, spiritual teachers, Jewish or otherwise, that I'm aware of were actually talking about. Um, they weren't concerned about life after death. Uh, Jesus' talk about the kingdom of God was tapping into the possibility of justice, peace, and love taking root in this world. Um, it's the idea that things on earth right now uh, could be different, um, could be as they are in the divine realm, uh, whatever that might be or however we might describe it. Um, this is how people imagined, uh, so 2,000 years ago, this is what they imagined um, and what they called the rule and reign of God in this world. If God is love and God is just and God is peace, then of, and, and God is our king, um, then this is what God's kingdom will look like. Justice, peace, and love. And there was a longing for that reality to manifest itself in their lives, in that actual moment. So the message of the kingdom of God is about the present moment in the transformation of this life, this world, this reality, not some spiritual otherworldly thing. It's about the concrete, earthy, flesh and blood um, existence. Um, Jesus referred to this possibility of this sort of way of life as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Um, others during this time um, referred to it as olam haba or the life to come or the world that is coming. Um, in our attempt uh, at Open Circle to be as inclusive, generous, and creative as possible, um, because this teaching of Jesus isn't exclusive to Christianity. Um, this is what at Open Circle we would call a more loving world. That's what we mean by a more loving world. Um, a world of peace, justice, and love 
in this world, in the concrete reality, in existence of our daily lives. In Jesus's first words in the Gospel of Mark are, the kingdom of God or a more loving world has come near. In other translations of this passage and in other passages where Jesus talks about this, um, he says, uh, a more loving world has come near, a more loving world is at hand, a more loving world is within us, a more loving world is among us, a more loving world is coming, a more loving world is bursting forth, a more loving world is breaking through. Jesus begins his sort of public work in teaching in Mark's gospel with a declaration. Um, it's a proclamation um, that a more loving world is real and it is possible and it is already happening. Um, and he gives it with this invitation to believe the good news. Okay, cool story, Matt. Um, what on earth might this mean for us? And what does this have to do with our trajectory for the next couple of months? The proclamation and the declaration of Jesus that a more loving world is possible, that it is at hand, that it has come near, that it is within us, that it is among us, um, that peace and justice and love are emerging um, is ultimately a message of hope. This is a message of hope about reality. And friends, I don't know how any of us are going to continue to make sense of all that we've been experiencing the past six months and really the past several years. Um, whether you want to talk about the, the conversation in our politics or no matter how cute they may be in their little masks, the reality that our kids are wearing masks to school and that this is reality. Like how are we going to continue to make sense of all of that? for our families, for our community, for our country, for our world. And you all know, if you've been a, a part of Open Circle for any, for any amount of time, that I get sucked into the death spiral of darkness um, and the news cycle. And I know that's come through in my presence and in my teachings at Open Circle um, because it's a lot and it's real. Uh, but despite all of the evidence to the contrary, the belief in the possibility of a more loving world means we cling to hope, that we allow hope to narrate the story we're living in, and we trust that nothing is wasted along the way. And I want to be really clear that I'm not talking about what many of us have experienced as cliche Christian hope that's actually just wrapped in avoidance, um, avoidance of reality, and it's wrapped in comfort and privilege. Um, we have to stay informed and educated, and we have to keep learning. And we have to pay attention to what's happening in our own life, in our, in our own bodies, and in our relationships, in our country, in our world. We have to pay attention. Um, we have to keep growing in our capacity to honor pain in our ability to welcome disruption and to grieve. And we can't ever minimize the reality of injustice and inequality, and we have to get to work. But we must never despair because the belief in a more loving world means that while things may never look or feel like they once were, and while the pain of what may have happened to us recently or at any point in our lives or, or the pain that we have caused or the things we have left undone, all of that may be unbearable to feel. Um, but we live with the hope that it doesn't have to be like it was or it doesn't have to be like this. We live with the hope that it's, it's not always going to be this way. And we, we must never think that having eyes to see all that is being revealed means that only seeing what is broken. It also means that in the midst 
of darkness and brokenness, we also have eyes to see that a more loving world is bursting forth. Living with hope means that every moment of our lives, no matter how dark or painful it all may seem, is an invitation to possibility. Every moment of our lives is an invitation into possibility, the possibility of a more loving world. Every moment of our lives is a moment of possibility, the possibility of love bursting forth in us and among us and through us. Friends, this is the heart of the mission of our community. Um, and I think it's vital to making sense of our lives and our world in any sort of healthy and sustainable way right now. I think this is captured uh, in the words of the 20th century Jewish mystic and philosopher Abraham Joshua Heschel, who says this. Remember, there is meaning beyond absurdity. Know that every deed counts, that every word is power. And above all, remember that you must build your life as if it were a work of art. Remember that there is meaning beyond absurdity. Know that every deed counts, that every word is power. Above all, remember that you must build your life as if it were a work of art. So let's spend the next few months exploring the non-essential way. Let's receive this invitation into the possibility of the moment, the actual moment right now in this larger moment that we're living in. Um, over the next uh, few weeks, we're gonna talk about uh, how we think, we're gonna talk about now, we're gonna talk about you, we're gonna talk about us. We're gonna talk about religion. We're gonna talk about politics. We're gonna talk about economics. And we'll see where it goes from there. And we're going to have the opportunity to hear from some remarkable guests sharing stories, leading practices in teaching. Um, and I couldn't be more excited. Um, and I can't wait to see what we discover along the way together. Because um, remember, um, as we cling to hope and allow hope to narrate our stories, we're reminded that this is not a caravan of despair.